It'll be good. Hi, my name is Chip Anderson. Um, welcome to the talk. Um, so we're going to start out with a little bit of, uh, you know, who is this guy? Uh, can everyone see that okay? Is that big enough? I can make it bigger if that's, if that's good. Um, so I'm the president of StockCharts.com. I'm also an adjunct professor here at, at Lake Washington Tech. I've worked at Microsoft. Uh, I worked at Microsoft from 1987 to 1997. I was a programmer on Windows 1, Windows 2, and Windows 3.0. I worked on Visual Studio. I also went around the country helping lots of Fortune 500 companies learn how to do client server um, programming with Visual Basic and SQL Server back in the day. In 1999, I founded StockCharts.com. Uh, that's the company that I currently work with. We're coming up on our 20th anniversary, which is quite amazing. Hey, how's it going? Um, we provide high quality financial charts for online investors. Uh, we have over 40,000 uh, paying subscribers right now, 24 employees. The offices are down on Willows Road, so they're just uh, less than a mile away from here as the crow flies. And we run a, uh, currently we run our own data center with about 100 servers running Java, Java servlets under Tomcat. But we are actually, this week, uh, continuing this effort to migrate into the Amazon cloud, and we're doing more and more and more of our workload in the cloud. Uh, quite exciting stuff. I've been teaching here at LW Tech for two um, quarters. My wife used to teach here a long time ago. I'm teaching uh, the C-sharp class, uh, 228, and I see many of my students. Thank you. Uh, and I'm also, uh, next quarter, I'll be teaching the programming project class, 229. It'll clearly be the programming project class of doom. <laughs> All right. So there were, that's not on the test. That's just a quick, who am I? Who is this idiot talking to you? So when, why does he get to say some of the things that I'm about to say? So we're going to go on a, a little bit of a reality check. I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a reality check because I hire you guys. I hire people for my company, technical developers who are trying to get working with a nice internet company and maybe a nice startup kind of thing. We 20 years old, but we still feel like a startup. I interview candidates on a regular basis. They make the same mistakes again and again and again. It drives me crazy. I'm gonna try very hard to share with you some of the insight, maybe get you to think a little meta, a little bigger than just, okay, I'm taking my class and I'm so laser focused on what I'm doing right now. I want you to think on the bigger picture. And I also wanna try and get you to see things from my perspective or from the perspective of uh, a tech company trying to hire um, programming talent. So that's our goal. Why would you want to listen to me talk about this stuff? And why do you want to maybe even pay attention to what I'm saying? Well, you're playing a game right now. You may not fully realize that you're playing a game, again, because you're so deep into the coursework at this point. But you're here. There's a bunch of steps that are going to happen. Then you're going to graduate. Yay. There are a bunch of other steps that are going to happen, which you may or may not know about. Hopefully, then you'll get hired. Yay. Guess what? There's still more steps after that we're going to talk about because I want to get you to a really good paying job. Who here would like a job 150K a year? Uh, our programmers start at 80K and they very quickly get up to 120 or higher, depending on how well a job they do. Um, that's my particular company, so I can talk directly about that. Other companies do it differently, but th those prices and those figures are all fairly competitive in the Seattle job market. We have to be competitive with Microsoft, Amazon, everybody else. So these numbers are not bogus numbers. These numbers are real numbers if you're willing to do the work. Think about that for a second. What would you be willing to, if I had $150,000 on this table, what would you be willing to do to get that money? Crawl on broken glass, <laughs> crawl across hot lava, study for your midterm. <laughs> there, there actually are students, many students, that make the wrong choice because they lose track of the end goal. I'm going to play my game instead of study for my final. All right, so on their tombstone, it will be, he was a great game player. It won't be, you know, he invented the next version of the internet. So. This talk is going to be a little serious here because I want to try and get you into the mindset of you're playing a game, a serious game, about trying to get a serious job, a good job, a good paying job. Um, so 
Um, there's good news, bad news, and then there's some more good news. Some of this I've already talked about. Again, there are lots of jobs in Seattle. Amazon just announced their um, new headquarters in New York and Washington, D.C., but as part of that announcement, it became um, the, the article I was reading said that Seattle is still the second largest tech job market in the country. Who knows what number one is? San Francisco, yeah. So, uh, so we're still doing good. New York is three, so that's why Amazon might have gone there. Um, and so there are lots of jobs here. That's the very good news. The other thing is this is an industry, this industry is unique. It is still super easy to create your own company. It's still super easy to take an idea, even if you don't graduate, to take an idea as a programmer and turn that into a real thing. The next Facebook, the next, next whatever, the next stock charts, please not that. <laughs> um, Totally possible to do that. So there's also that. The other industries don't necessarily have those options. You can't do that as a doctor. You can't just become a doctor. So there is some bad news here. Um, first off, a lot of students come with the attitude of all I have to do is graduate and I'm guaranteed a job. All I have to do is graduate, I'm going to get a job. Not true. 120% not true. That's really bad news. I know that everyone's focused on passing their classes and graduating. Graduating is a wonderful thing. Does not get you a job. Does not guarantee you anything. It helps. Doesn't guarantee you anything. Um, all these jobs here in Seattle, tons of competition. I'm talking to you guys, and there's a lot of people in this room. There's 10, a thousand times the number of people in this room looking for jobs in the Seattle area right now. Good, we have some more handouts we'll be passing around. Thank you. Um, that's just reality. You're playing a game, it's a deadly game. It's a serious game. You, the competition is huge. It may seem like, again, we're here in this nice, safe environment at Lake Washington Tech, it's wonderful. Um, no. You're participating in this much, much larger game. You're competing as graduates and regular candidates from all the other colleges, also from just basically anywhere in the world. Everyone is applying to work at Microsoft. Everyone is applying to work at Amazon. Um, I'll also be, I don't think this is really a big deal, but I'm, I gotta mention it, because I'm trying to be real here. Um, sometimes people hire based on the networks that they're involved with. And one of the strongest networks that people hire from are college networks, all right? And so if the hiring people or the, the particular team that's doing hiring is affiliated or, or familiar with the University of Washington, they're going to favor those candidates over you guys. Sorry, it's the fact of life. There is some good news, I'll get to that in just a second. But the point is, that's another challenge that people have to overcome necessarily if they're not in the, one of the top schools, and everyone at some point is not in the top school, depending on which list you look at, uh, you have to make sure that you stand out from the people that are in that school. It's not that the people in that school were necessarily guaranteed a job, but they have a little bit of an advantage over someone who isn't in that school. So that is a reality we have to deal with. Getting this dream job that I'm talking about, getting a good programming job requires work and time. Who wants to put in more work and time? Y'all are already working really hard. I know this for a fact because again, I teach here, I see this with my students, they all have jobs or they all have families, they all have uh, things that are taking their time. And that's the great thing about Lake Washington Tech, we try and accommodate that. The problem is the job market doesn't necessarily accommodate that as much as like Washington Tech does. This is a situation where I think it's worth putting, you, you, the goal is there, you need to work hard to get there. There's a lot of things that potentially could be holding you back, but that goal is super valuable. Don't lose sight of it. Don't fade in the last you know, quarter mile of your marathon. Just graduating isn't enough. You have to put in more work. Sorry, but the good news is, got good news, hopefully, hopefully I didn't depress too many people with that one. Um, it is worth it, and I'm gonna try and show you the steps today, or some of the steps that I think can really give you a leg up, even over graduates from those other colleges. And like I said, Lake Washington Tech instructors do care. That's the good thing about Lake Washington Tech. Um, we understand, we care, we're trying to make things better, make things um, 
more swing in your favor. So that's why I teach here, that's why I'm doing this talk, that's why other people teach here, right Tom? All right, so here are the 12 steps to 150K. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Who's willing to do this? What would you do for 150K right here on the table? Those are the steps, just do those, you'll be good. Let's talk about those steps. That's the rest of this presentation. Step number one sounds pretty fuzzy. I know people are programmers, we like to just program, we like to just be in the bits and the bytes and the, and the code and the numbers. No, to get a job, to get a good job, you have to be passionate. You have to understand what it is you're trying to join. You're not trying to join a company per se, we're gonna go over this, you're gonna join a team. The team cares about what that team's doing. The team wants other people who join them to be just as caring, just as passionate about what it is they do. If you wanna work on Alexa, you would better damn well care a ton about Alexa and voice recognition. Well, Amazon just won't give you the job unless you do. You better know, before you even apply to the job, you better know Alexa pretty much inside and out. You better be impressive with your knowledge of Alexa. That's passion. So where do you get that passion? I'm gonna give you a, a, an example here at the bottom of this slide, but it's important that you reconnect. Why are you doing this? Why are you, why are you programming? Why are you taking this course, these courses? Um, I take it, I program because it's the, you can create programming, you can create something out of nothing. You can create really, really valuable stuff out of nothing. You can just think it up and it's there and boom, it's really valuable and it works and it helps people. Can't do that in many other industries. Very hard. Very hard to come up with another industry that is that much opportunity just for thinking. And so that's why I love programming. Um, and I do remember, I still periodically get in touch with that feeling I had when I first got my first real program to run for me. This is not the program your instructor assigned. This is the program you wrote for you. I had an idea, I thought it up, I coded it up, it worked. I shared it with other people, they liked it, yay. Those are good feelings, those are real feelings, those are what programming is really all about. Not doing what your instructor told you to do, maybe but taking what, maybe taking what he, told, he or she told you to do and making it better. Programming is always about making stuff better. All right, can you tell I'm a little passionate about this? <laughs> All right, so let's say you're not super passionate about it. There's another approach. I don't recommend it, but it's there. Again, some people are here. Well, I'm about reality. Some people are here for the money. I totally get it. The money is important. That's fine if that gets you in the door. I'm hoping over the course of your career as a student, we can shift you into something where you're a little more emotionally passionate about programming and you enjoy programming. If you're doing programming as a job and you actually hate it, you're just here for the money, I'm not positive I'm gonna be able to get you hired. So keep that in mind. So again, how do you stir your passion? Write your own programs. You're programmers. Why are you just writing the stuff that the instructor assigns? You can write anything you want. Have you ever written a program other than what the instructor assigned? If the answer to that's no, why are you a programmer? Start to think, you gotta think that way. That's how you're going to get ahead of all the other competition. That right there will get you ahead possibly 50, 60% of the other people in this job market. The people who are just doing the work the instructor assigns, they're gonna, be, they're gonna put me to sleep during their interview. I'm not gonna be super thrilled about talking to them. Because I'm going to be asking you during your interview, what did you write for yourself? I want to know that. The fact that you wrote, I don't know, a, a link list program that the instructor assigned, yeah, great, terrific, fine, I figured that out because you graduated. What did you write for yourself? What are, and then what are you going to do for me when I hire you that makes my company more valuable, more useful, more money? I need to see that passion before I'm going to hire you. All right, I'm already behind on time, I'm sure. Um, all right, so there's a chicken egg problem here too. I need to know, and, and people who are hiring need to know what experience you have. How do you, and it's, to get experience you have to get hired, but to get hired you need experience. That doesn't seem quite fair, um, but it's kind of the way it is. Why is this a problem? Companies don't train you. 
They don't train you in the basics. There's a bar, there's a level of knowledge that we expect programmers to have when we hire them and when we want them to, to fly on their own. That's the first thing, you were expected to hit the ground running. The second thing that's super important to understand is we companies only hire when they have a need. This is another fallacy that a lot of students have. Amazon just hires because it has to. I'll, I'll just get a job at Amazon, they're always hiring. Even at Amazon, they only hire when they have a need. In stock charts, it's particularly true, we're a small company. We, ha we, have, we have to have pain, we have to have existing pain or a huge opportunity in front of us before we're gonna hire somebody else. We don't just hire people because. And if that's true, companies only hire when they really need someone, you have to, you can't get trained, you're not gonna be trained, you have to go immediately, you have to hit the ground running and contribute pretty much immediately, at least in the general sense of programming. In addition, there's tons of other candidates out there that have more experience than you. I don't care how much experience anybody in this room has, there are candidates out there that have more experience than me, probably. There's always a better candidate somewhere. What are you doing to get as much programming experience as possible? Well, I'm doing the assignments the, the instructor gave me. Okay, good, <laughs> don't not do those, but you're gonna need to do more is, is unfortunately the message here. So how? Um, go above and beyond your classes. If you can't think of a program to write yourself that makes your life better, take a program that was assigned to you and make it better. All right? We just wrote life in the C-sharp program, C-sharp class. Anybody want to try 3D life? Why not? How about 1D life? It exists. Do that. There are lots and lots of different, you can do colors, you can, all the different kinds of things you can do. Why aren't you doing any of that? Those are programs, not only are gonna make you a better programmer, they're gonna help you in the interview, and I'll show you why in just a minute. Another thing, super important, the way this works. Programming, I think, as an industry, is actually an apprenticeship-based industry. Uh, it's not officially that way, but I think in reality it is. You have to find an internship. You have to find something that will cause you to become a better programmer and start working at companies. You have to kickstart this, this vicious cycle of I need more experience, how do I get more experience? I have to have a, more experience to get hired. Internships are a way that you can get experience without necessarily getting hired. They're still competitive. You still, it's almost like a, um, a mock getting hired situation but it's e it should be generally easier to get an internship. You the requirements for you getting an internship are a lot less than for getting a job. And so internships are super important. They, pat they help your resume, they help you learning experience, they give you more real world experience. Um, I'm gonna show you again how everything just flows into itself. You have, in my opinion, you have to get internships to get a great job. Because every, all your other competition has gotten internships. They all, they all have. Um, okay, and then the bottom line, again, passionately, um, learn as much as you possibly can about as much as you possibly can. This field is constantly changing. It's constantly reinventing itself. There's new techniques, new, new things. How many people have an AWS or Azure um, server out in the, on the cloud right now? They are free, people. They're free. Just go there and sign up and get your own server. Guess what? You're gonna leapfrog a huge number of, of this competition I'm talking about. If you get your own cloud server, you start playing with it and learn those concepts, even if it isn't assigned by the instructor. Am I too passionate here? Should I dial it down? Am I doing okay? <laughs> I'm gonna go home and work on my resume. <laughs> This industry is so wonderful because you can create something for nothing and they're giving it to you for free and, and some students are taking advantage of that. I don't know why not. It drives me crazy. I would, I, would, I would leapfrog all of you guys so easily. All the people that are doing that. Not you guys, other guys. All right, why? Why is that important? Because you have to package yourself properly. You are marketing yourself to the tech industry. There's lots and lots, the recruiters see lots, and interviewers see lots and lots of candidates. You have to stand out, how are you gonna do it? You have to think about that before you go on the interview. The number of people that show up in front of me and don't know what Stock Charts does, 
It's huge. We had one yesterday. We had one yesterday coming in as a graphic designer. He had no idea what we did. That interview was over in half a second. I still had to suffer through 30 minutes of trying to entertain this guy, but he had no business being there. It's insane. Um, you need to package yourself properly and you need to research the companies you're applying to. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, the important thing is you're programmers. Do you have a website? Yes. Do you have a LinkedIn account? Do you have a cloud server showing off all your code that you did in your programming classes? GitHub, do you have, are you, have you contributed to an open source project? All of these things, your competition has done and more. And they haven't just created a simple little website, maybe with a, with a uh, plugin or two and to make it you know, look nice. They've, they programmed the website from scratch. They know how it's programmed because they're going to get asked about it in the interview. If you do something like that, you will get asked about it. You will be impressive, but you will also be asked about it. LinkedIn is, is the de facto thing. I think that's just the, the minimum required is a good LinkedIn page. And your own website, I think, is even better. The bottom line, though, is create a compelling story. You are on a journey. You started the journey when you first saw your first computer. The journey got more interesting when you first wrote your first program. It got even more interesting when you first failed at writing your, a program. I'm interested in knowing about that. It got more interesting when you took your first programming classes and passed. It got interesting when you did a project, maybe with other people. That got very interesting. I want to know, as an, as an interviewer, I want to know all that story. Please tell it to me. The number of candidates that don't tell me that story or that make me drag it out of them is insane. It's a lot. You, this, this story of your journey and what you've learned and what you, what you know and what you tried and what you failed at and all that stuff, that's actually the most important thing in the initial interview that when you do an initial interview for a tech company. You need to have examples of your code. Uh, you don't want to over-exaggerate, but on the other hand, do not under-exaggerate. Definitely tell the truth. Do not lie. You will get called on it. If you say you know Scrum, you better know Scrum. Um, but on the other hand, don't under-exaggerate. If you spend a lot of time working on something, by all means, your job interview and your resume and your packaging of your website, that's when you shout it to the world. Hey, here's who I am. Here's what I've done. Here's my passion. If you don't do that, somebody with more passion is going to get the job. Again, don't use anything really, you know, cheesy and snazzy. We all, we've seen it all. And we'll call it, we'll ask you if you wrote it yourself. Um, how can you um, research your competition? So there's this nebulous group of people that are also competing for these jobs out there. What are they doing? Do you know? Have you spent time kind of looking around on LinkedIn to see what other people's profiles look like? Maybe somebody who just got hired by Amazon, you can go find his LinkedIn profile, see what, what they did. Uh, you can Google phrases, Amazon programming job. That's gonna turn up a whole bunch of stuff. One of my favorite sites is Quora. I don't know if you've been on that one. Lots of cute questions, answers about all different topics there, but Quora about job seeking and job hunting is, is a gold mine full of really great information. Glassdoor is another one. You know what that one is? That's where people who get fired bitch about their company. <laughs> the point is, is your packaging as good or better than your competition? Absolutely make sure or find ways to make yours better by reading what they're doing. Uh, job hunting networks, networking. Networking is a, is a term that sometimes gets overused and abused, but it is super important. And it's important in this context. People get hired in two ways now. The, the recruiters that are out there, for, especially for big companies, are overwhelmed with resumes. Too many resumes flooding in the front door. Honestly, the, the, the initial normal path that you submit a resume, say, to Amazon, it's pointless. There's a bajillion resumes going in through that pathway. Amazon's trying to keep on top of them, but they can't, they can't tell. It's impossible to tell. I have a friend who works at Amazon. He's in, involved. He's a developer, but he's involved in recruiting. And uh, he says those things are really, really almost close to worthless. Um, there are other ways, though, to get involved or get noticed by large companies and even other companies. And that's the networks that you belong to. 
One of the most important networks, I've already mentioned this, is college-oriented networks. Absolutely stay in touch with your college professors. Use them. Make sure they're aware of where you're at in your job hunt. If, if they hear about something and they think of your name, you will get the opportunity. If they hear about something and they have no idea where you're at, somebody else will get the opportunity. Keep, your, keep those, not just your college invest, uh, professors, but any, everybody associated with the college that you're aware of. I know the college, Lake Washington Tech, has a, a career placement organization. Absolutely take advantage of that. Um, but that, I've, I told, I've told my, um, my daughter, my son, or, or my, da my son just graduated, my daughter's getting ready to go to college. I told them the, the experience of going to college is amazing. The degree is super valuable. The alumni network may be the most important thing that you get out of college, maybe, depends. But that's something to, uh, to try and take full advantage of as much as you can. This job hunting network, you, you wanna activate, you wanna, make, you wanna grow it and activate it and cultivate it and keep it working for you. People get hired because of the most random reasons, because timing just happened to be right. It happened to be the right place at the right time to hear about the right job in the right situation, and it just all worked out. That's, certain, that's mainly my situation. I happen to be in the right place at the right time to get hired at Microsoft. Um, don't discount any of that. The, the way that that, the way the, that might sound like it's luck, but the way that luck happens is you've cast a big net. And your, your job hunting network, keeping that growing could be more, most fun. Some of these things, by the way, just as a side note here, I'm giving you these tips. Some of these tips do not require a college degree to work. Okay, I'm not, I'm not, you should get your college degree, absolutely, get your college degree, it's a good, good thing. But the point is, sometimes life isn't really that organized. You have to be in a good position to take advantage of it if luck comes your way, and that's part of what this is about. Uh, this, target, this company you wanna work at, the company that, you wanna, that you're applying to, especially if you get an interview at it, they expect you to know about them. They expect you to know a lot about them because there is a lot to know about each company and all that information is generally on the internet anyway. So you should know who the CEO is. You should know who the departments are. You should know the kind of um, uh, tools that the developers there typically use. At the very least, again, LinkedIn, Glassdoor, you can, you can do searches and figure out what kind of things Amazon programmers are actually working with on a daily basis. Maybe more importantly, why are they hiring? Again, they're not hiring just because. Nobody hires just because. They hire because they have a need. What are those needs? That little tidbit of information might be the most important thing you can understand about a company. What are their current needs and why are they considering me? I can then tailor my cover letter, my resume, my interview, and anything else, any other interaction I have with the company to show them that I can help them meet that need. I can help them meet that need better than somebody, than some random person who doesn't even know how to spell Amazon or whatever, the or stock charts. Whatever. Um, so yeah, it's all of this, this thing. Um, how many people did they hire the last year, the last quarter? Is, is the number of hires going up or going down? All of this is great kind of behind the scenes information. This is stuff, by the way, you do before you apply. I haven't even gotten to the part where you send out, write, even write a resume yet. This is all kind of the research that you need to understand in order to do the next thing, which I think, if I remember right, is a targeted resume and cover letter. When somebody writes a, uh, uh, an email to me, all right, I get, in terms of job applications, I get probably 10 or 20 a day, and most of them are complete generic robot, generated robot sent, generic letters, emails that have not, that don't say a thing about stock charts. If I don't see the word stock charts in the first paragraph, delete. Even if I do, it, it's probably deleted, it depends, but um, it's, it's your, your opportunity, so that, that expression, you never get a second chance to make a good first impression, totally true in this world. Not necessarily true in other places, true in this world. Never ever send a generic resume for a job you really want, because you really won't get it. You have to, oh my God, Chip, I have to work. Here's 150K, you're gonna crawl across broken glass, you can at least customize your cover letter. 
Seriously? How hard is this? It's not that hard and it's super important. It's a chance for you to shine and get, again, even more ahead of that huge mass of competition that you're trying to outdistance yourself from, you're trying to, to distinguish yourself from. And that cover letter had better show, it, it should, it's not just platitudes. Again, people see cover letters many, many times a day, if not thousands of times. And they see customized cover letters a lot too. Your customized cover letter has to prove you understand their need and you understand, and you're, and you're almost quickly gonna show them how you can help fill that need. It needs to connect. It doesn't need to just be a form letter that happened to have a couple of um, things filled in. They can tell. Again, don't lie or exaggerate, but on the other hand, don't be shy or bashful either. You know what you want, go for it. Now's the time to go for it. You can be shy the rest of your life with 150K a year, <laughs> very easily. To get there though, you have to, you have to champion yourself. You have to be passionate. Bring up your reasons in this cover letter for why you want to be passionate about programming. And then target your resume as well. The cover letter is super important. A lot of people don't even include it. But the resume itself is also important. Resumes uh, can feature your experience in different ways. There's no rule that says you have to do it 100% chronological. There's no rule that says you have, to leave, you have to document every single thing that you did in your life from lemonade stand salesman all the way down. Tailor the experience in your resume, the feature, the skill set that this company is looking for. Super important. Make it clear that you are, I don't know, a C++ programmer with a lot of C++ experience. If somebody's just glancing at your resume, they've got, you've got literally a second maybe of their time to glance at this resume, you wanna make 100% sure they see you are a C++, experienced C++ programmer. They can gloss over all the other stuff about SQL and whatever else, al the alphabet soup that everyone has on their resumes, but the point is, again, find out their need, feature it in your cover letter, feature it in your resume. So the goal of all that is to get an initial interview. So the game we're playing is get ready, send out your resumes, get an initial interview. The initial interview is just a starting point. It's the one, uh, sometimes there may be intermediate steps, like maybe you're talking to the company during a job fair. By the way, there's a job fair tomorrow here. Um, so that's going to help, but eventually your goal is to get to the company to meet with some of their employees and talk to them in what's called an initial interview. If the company's small, they may compress the process, but if the company's large, Microsoft, Amazon, that kind of thing, there'll be initial interview and then there'll be a callback second interview. The goal of the initial interview is to get you to the second interview. That's, that's the only thing that matters. So remember that, that's the game that you're playing at this point in time. So what are, you do, what are you doing during this initial interview and what is the company looking for? It's a time where a lot of people get very nervous, especially if you haven't done it before. Um, the company's goal is to see, are you even close to a fit for our culture, our teams, the kind of developers we have, or are you a complete wild card that isn't going to mesh with our current needs? That can very quickly be determined. Um, they want to validate your experience. You put all this stuff on your resume. Is it true? Because if they catch you in a lie, you're out. Uh, and then second off, finally, um, are you passionate and are you interested in the position? Do you, do you understand the position we're asking for? Does your skills meet that position thing? And are you interested in doing that going forward? Those are, kind of, those are the core things that they're interested in during this initial interview. I'll say there's a side note, which is they also, the interviewers in particular, don't wanna be bored. They want you to entertain them. They want you to tell and display your passion and tell your story in a narrative that they can get behind and they can understand and they can ask questions about. If you're very quiet and they're having to ask questions to pull information out of you, that's not gonna, it's probably not gonna work well. Probably, it depends. Again, the ultimate goal here is to get invited back for a technical interview. Um, you want, in a perfect world, if you're good at this, your goals are you wanna already appear like you fit in with the company. You can do that with a lot of research, we'll talk about it in a second. 
You want to make 100% sure that they understand why you want to work there. So you want to emphasize, re-emphasize what you talked about in your cover letter, re-emphasize what you stressed in your resume. Um, you're there, you want to make sure they have all their questions about your resume answered, and you want to make sure that they understand the skills that you have, uh, that you're most uh, good at. Good at. Um, da, 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 da. So there's some enemies that you have while you're doing this initial interview. Maybe the biggest enemy that people don't know about is being boring. Um, again, even if you're shy, even if um, uh, uh, human interaction is not necessarily your strong point, you gotta crawl across broken glass in this interview. You gotta suck it up and find a way with practice that, and other kinds of techniques, whatever technique you can come up with, you have to be engaging, you have to be, inter you have to be communicative and put yourself across to somebody else, which can be really scary, I get it, but it's, it's, it's the nature of the, this particular activity. Uh, and a, a way to help with that, again, is to focus on narrative. Tell your story. It's a great time. You can be totally um, narcissistic. about you. You're talking about you. This is the time to talk about you. So go ahead and do that. Um, give them stories, anecdotes, things that you've done so they can ask you questions back to get more details about it. We as interviewers are dying to engage with an interview candidate. If the candidate will just give us something we can talk to them about so we can get a better sense of who they are, where they're coming from, what their passions are. So give us, a, give us some way that we can ask questions and get, in, get into a discussion with you. Uh, the clock's super important too. Uh, you can't waste their time at all. Uh, absolutely show up early for interviews. Don't be late to, uh, being late to interview, it's, it's, it's pointless. It's, it's really, really, for, when, for large companies especially, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of pain and agony for no good reason. Um, the dress code is something else you might, might want to try to help with. All of this is, is part of matching their culture. Uh, we've had people show up at, at stock charts in um, full suits and ties and everything. We, we wear this. Um, it's pretty clear. That we were, and, and it's okay, it is absolutely okay, in my opinion, for tech companies at least, to ask them before you come, what's the dress code? What are you expecting? Do you want me to wear you know, tucks and tails or do you want me to wear jeans? Clearly you don't want to go super casual, never go super casual, but, but you don't want to be overdressed. It'll make everybody in the room feel uncomfortable, including you, which is the worst. So you don't assume formal, don't assume casual, figure it out, ask. As I mentioned, nervousness and shyness, unfortunately, you gotta get over this. Um, my recommendation here is a lot of practice, a lot of research, knowing what you're gonna have going in, and then maybe the most important piece of information I have for people in terms of interviewing, don't interview with your favorite company first. Don't interview with your favorite company second. They're number three. The first two are companies that you could care less about. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> but you're gonna flub that one. The goal is by number three, you're gonna be better at it. You're gonna be more comfortable with it. You're gonna be, it will be less of an alien planet experience. You have to get two or three, if you, and if you can't do it with actual interviews, then at least do it with um, maybe some friends or your family pretending to be interviewers, although that's, that's not as good as actually going. You're gonna screw it up a couple of times. Totally, everyone does, it's totally fine. Do that with a company that isn't at the top of your list. Uh, if you do get caught off guard, it happens. Don't over-focus on that, force those thoughts out of your brain. Say, it's fine, the interview has seen way worse before. I'm not the worst they've ever seen by a long shot. I'm gonna keep going. Um, if you get completely confused, just go back to your resume and just pick something and start talking about something on your resume. Start that process again of explaining your experience and how your experience connects with their company. That's all they really want to talk about anyway. All right, so the goal of the initial interview is to get to the technical interview. Yes, we're getting close. Um, the technical interview a lot of times can be tricky. They're not, not all companies do it, and the ones that do it are changing how they do it. I, I can only talk about how we used to do it at Microsoft, and that is many years ago. Um, I can also talk about what my friend tells me is currently being done at Amazon, but I don't know if that's, that's the norm or not. The idea here is they will give you a programming problem, they'll give you a whiteboard, they'll ask you, you know, help us with this programming problem. 
The goal here is they want to see your thinking process. They do not care if you get it right or wrong. Don't think that there's pressure. Oh my God, if I don't get this right, if I screw it up in any way, shape, or form, I'm toast. That is the furthest from the truth. The truth is, if you get to this point, they are interested in you. All you need to do is prove to them that you're a logical person. That you have the ability to think logically and not just freeze or vapor lock. Many, many candidates at Microsoft, we were hiring into the Windows team, they get in front of the whiteboard, they explain the problem, they get up there and they wouldn't write. They're not even writing any part of the program as a four line program. They weren't even writing that on the whiteboard. They were just sitting there kind of trying to puzzle out the answer. And they, they might at the end, none, none of them did, but say they, at the end of it, they might've written, you know, 128, which maybe, let's say that was the answer. If they just wrote that on the whiteboard and nothing else, they'd still fail. They'd fail miserably. I wanna know their thought process. I wanna know the steps that they're going through in their brain. The point is when you're in a technical interview, there is no such thing as saying too much. You should say everything that comes into your brain in the course of a technical interview. For one, it'll show them that you're thinking. Two, it'll show them your thinking process, which is really what they wanna know about. Three, it'll give them an opportunity to maybe help you if you gotta go off the rails. This is not unlike taking an exam in the college. If I get back an exam back, if somebody has, has given me you know, a lot of, of their thought process and maybe they get the answer wrong, I can still grade their thought process and give them a lot of partial credit for it. Same rules apply here. If you get stuck, keep explaining what you're thinking, keep, and then keep asking questions. The other thing they might wanna be seeing is can you ask an intelligent question based on the problem? It's not necessarily that you're gonna get the answer but you can maybe ask the one question that will quickly get you the answer. That's almost, that's, that's pretty much a pass for a technical interview as well. Um, and draw and diagram. Again, anything that comes to your, draw pictures. Here's an array and I'm, I've got a pointer into the array and just draw. Give them something so they can help you with it if you're getting stuck or they can at least see your thought process. Do not panic. Hey, congrats, you got hired. Good job. So that gets you entry-level salary, health benefits, a terrible commute, and um, an interior office with no hope of sunlight whatsoever. Good job. Um, it's not over, you don't get the 150K yet. A lot of people Stop or stop or don't, you know, they, they take a breather, which is fine. You can take a breather at that point. There's, you've still got ways to go though. You have to become, you have to get on the right team and you have to become super valuable to the company. You have to constantly be look, it's the competition is still exists. It hasn't gone away. You're now just competing with the other employees. Now I'm not saying competing, competing, you're a team, you're working together, it's fine. Please do that and please be successful. But you also, especially in large companies, you understand some teams are better than other teams. First point. So what are the really good teams at this company? And can I get in on those teams? There are many, many, many great programmers who didn't, for whatever reason, end up on a good team. All right, they, and they kind of stuck at the entry level salary positions, which is fine. I mean, if that's your goal, that's fine. But you can't really be passionate. You can't really fully flower as a programmer if you're on something that's not really at the, at the sharp end of the spear for the company. Discover which teams in the company are mega important. Try and get into one of those teams, get associated with one of those teams, learn what those teams do. It's, it's almost like you're starting over again, this process of getting hired. You're gonna have to, the goal here is to get hired into a good team. You may not be there initially because that team wasn't hiring when you applied, but it's okay, you got into a team so now you have to get into a good team. Maybe. There's a network inside the company. Just like there was a, the, the, the alumni network and everything else here, there's a network in the company. Programmers tend to look down their nose at managers. Guess who tells programmers what teams they get to work on? Managers. Don't look down your nose at a manager. Make your manager's life better. And so that's what this final, th almost final thing is about. Make yourself invaluable to the company. Uh, companies do downsize. When they downsize, who goes first? The, the unvaluable people. 
Um, so even when you're in the company and hired, think meta. What problems is the company trying to solve? How does the company make money? What problems are you trying to solve? How can I contribute to that? How can I help the company with all these problems that they're having? And specifically, maybe even more locally, what's driving my manager nuts? Is there anything I can do to help my manager look better, succeed, so on and so forth? There's no downside to doing that. There's very little downside to making your manager better. Um, fix those problems and you'll be good. I'm not saying you know brown nose and, and to the exclusion of the rest of your, and backstab and any of that stuff. But I'm saying, don't be oblivious to the challenges of the company as well as the challenges of your team inside the company. Understand what those are. It's again, very, very common for programmers to just put their head down and code and then go, how in the world did I get fired? Or how in the world did I get shifted off this team onto some other terrible team? Um, what new skills, tools could greatly enhance your productivity and why aren't those being used? in the company. It's not necessarily I'm saying that you learn about a tool and you, you then go to your manager and say, we have to use this new tool, it's so wonderful. What I'm saying is understand the processes by which these tools are adopted by a team and then if the opportunity exists, suggest that they use that particular tool. So that's the difference between being a, uh, being a contributor and being a, uh, somebody who's causing trouble because you're just griping about the existing tools which nobody can change. Finally, this industry is very unique in many ways. I've talked about a couple. The one that's maybe the most interesting and, and important to understand is that this industry completely reinvents itself, well, mostly completely reinvents itself every four to eight years. The internet exists. Now we have social networking. Uh, that was a new thing. Now we have uh, REST APIs. Now we have um, just more new language has come out. New computer types of computers come out. We have the Internet of Things. We've got our computers everywhere. We have the cloud. We now have serverless computing in the cloud. I just told you to get a free server. You're already behind the times because everyone's moving to serverless. So again, catch up. Uh, <laughs> again, sorry, I'm, just, I'm exaggerating here for effect. Uh, the point, though, is that this industry doesn't stay still. That's an awesome thing about it. It's a terrible thing, though, if you're trying to just find a job and just, just be in my job, do my thing, nine to five. Doesn't happen here. You certainly don't get 150K or more a year with that, with that approach. You have to keep learning. You have to keep understanding. And, and that's true even when you're in a team that ne doesn't necessarily need additional skills. You should still be getting additional skills. It's all in the internet, Cordoba and everything else. Um, so on and so forth. Um, and by the way, I'm getting my master's degree now. It's a challenge. I'm having tons of fun and I have a midterm tomorrow, which I'm going to fail. But anyway, <laughs> uh, the point is, um, I, I, I'll, I'll make this point, very important. The other students in my master's class, my online master's class, there are about 15 of us. All of the other ones, all of them except me, are already hired in other companies and their companies are making them get masters in order to improve and retain their jobs. Some, a master's degree is seen as being, in computer science is seen as being requirement for some of these programming jobs. So if that feels like, oh my God, the road just got so much longer, <laughs> I'm getting my certificate and I'm thinking about maybe getting my bachelor's and now you're chip saying I gotta get a, ma oh my God. I'm not saying you have to do that, but I'm saying your competition, some of your competition is doing that. Um, teaching others is the best way to learn. That's why I'm doing this. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's about the interview, um, like, let's say, um, like in some case, like um, in my case, like uh, when you said about don't be shy, uh, like in my case, I have suffered from Asperger's syndrome, and sometimes, like when I try to find the right words, I kind of pause and stu stutter and stumble. What What would you suggest to you should you should just inform me then, like about that before that, so they don't think you're nervous or? I I understand where you're coming from. My son has a similar kind of situation. Um, it's a challenge. I get that it's a challenge. I didn't make the rules for society in this regard. Practice absolutely helps. 
I, I think practice, and maybe in this particular situation, a lot of practice is, is kind of what's going to be required to, to hoe this road. Um, the, there are possibly other options, but in general, though, if, if you are coming to a job interview, you have to make a positive impression. And you have to kind of give, the, give people a concrete sense of your passion and your strengths. And you have to advocate for you. Nobody else is going to be able to do it. That's the challenge. But if you've said the same kind of talk a hundred times, I don't know, 20 times, a hundred times, whatever, to friends or to a mirror or to whatever, you're going to be better at it. Okay. That's, that, that's certainly true. Okay. And I would strongly encourage, I, and I know it might be really tough, but this is that thing where you get over this hump and then life's going to be, you know, you're going to, that's how you get your dream job is the, that's the struggle you have to do to get your dream job. Yeah. So I get it. Yes, sir. Um, pass over two things that I've encountered a lot. Please. Job websites, Monster, Indeed, Hired. Um, the other thing is recruiters. Yes. I mean, I get called daily and at least over half of them are speaking Hindi. <laughs> <laughs> but, which, which I don't have a problem with. It's just I have I'm hard of hearing and I have a hard time understanding anyway. It has got me anywhere. Right. Yeah. That world used to be very valuable and popular. We used stock charts used to use Monster and a bunch of other stuff. In fact, recently we started work putting our toe back in it with ZipRecruiter because it seemed to be they were a little better. But actually, just today, my uh, HR person was bitching and moaning about ZipRecruiter kind of going. They, as they get popular, they get overwhelmed with bogus resumes and just from all over the world. And people will just apply for every job. They, they make it too easy to apply for every job regardless. They, it overwhelms the, uh, the people who are looking at these things. And ultimately, they start not looking at them or they just you have to skip over them because like 37 of them aren't even in the, the alphabet that you're able to read. Um, so it's, it, I'm not saying those can't work, but their effectiveness, especially in the tech arena, I think continues to just slide and it's a big challenge. Yes, Carol. Okay, uh, if there's no, uh, if there's not 100% uh, match with the position, do you think should we try to apply to that? So when you say much with the position, I didn't understand what that meant. Match. Match, okay. Um, you want to definitely, before you start all of this, you want to identify your dream jobs. And generally, you want to be targeting your, your work towards trying to get that dream job. On the way, you might have to go through, again, up, um, testing or, or, or applying to companies that aren't necessarily a dream job. They might surprise you, but also they'll give you experience, so you'll be better prepared when you get the interview, you know, at the, at the, at the, company you're, you're most interested in working at. The goal here is to try and minimize uh, vapor lock, nerves, sweating, um, just completely falling to pieces when you're in your important interviews. No, uh, I mean, uh, when it's like requirements, bachelor's degree, uh, like one year of experience, blah, 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 and I have, for example, uh, associate degree, but other skills kind of Right. Uh, should we try to apply that or not? You, you should. The reason that the job sites don't work is because every, there's no penalty in applying, and you, you should absolutely apply. Um, but keep in mind, going back to that networking slide that I had up, um, a lot of times for big companies, uh, if your resume is going in through the normal channels, it's they're going to have an AI look at it. It's going to have some criteria. It's, it's, it's going to be rejecting a whole bunch of stuff because it's got 10,000 other resumes that it considers better because it can't. It can only look at the the specifics. It can't. It can't evaluate um, any of the subjective aspects of things. That's where you need to again utilize the uh, the networking that you have. Listen. Keep, Make friends, find friends, find people who know what's going on at the particular company, work with the college here, and, and just find the special opportunity that allows you to get your resume in through a different channel rather than just the, the front door with, the, with this big AI screening. Yes? One thing I was going to add was one of my good friends who is really, really, really high up programming now. Okay. His kind of idea was he would 
he got his first job and he had a friend that worked there he got kind of close to and after a couple years he left and went somewhere else and after a while after he did his own thing his friend just moved up and up and up at that company and then he went back to him yes hey can i have a job so he started up here yeah that's a great example of networking from over here went up and up and up and he just kept going back and forth and now he's making like two million two million dollars go for it good for him he should be up here it is, and it's, again, I, I mention it because it's just something that as, as programmers we don't necessarily think about. Let me, let me say uh, one more point to Kirill's point, which is um, these other techniques I was mentioning, create your own website, do something spectacular on the web that, that will cause people to go, oh, wow, you, you did mapping of Mars in 3D, I don't, whatever. find something that's going to be well above and beyond the norm. That will also help you crack through that door. Yes, sir. Um, I just want to ask, uh, when it comes to interview, like, it, when, in certain in industries, how would you do it about an interview if they were more focused on, like, say, your portfolio rather than how you spoke? How would you, uh, like, say, like, if you're, like, say, a gay designer, which I'm trying to be. Sure. Would you just, would you just... Uh, just present the work and sort of explain what it is, and then that would be the interview, or would that? What would That'd definitely be a big piece of the interview, um, showing stuff you created, and but telling the story of how it was created, why it was created that way, as opposed to something else. Programming is always about trade-offs. I say this in my class all the time, right, Susan? There's always trade-offs. Every time you write a line of code, you are making a trade-off. Tell the story about the fact, make the recruiters understand. You understand those trade-offs. Here's why you made a particular trade-off that you made. You, you and and, and that, those kinds of things. Those stories, that, that narrative about not only this is what I did, but this is why I did it, this is how I did it, these were the decisions I made as I was going along that path. Super, super interesting and super valuable to interviewers, especially technical interviewers. Yes, Mike. Uh, do you have any suggestions for if you want to be more of a, not jack of all trades, but to be able to be uh, flexible and move into other uh, areas like uh, design or uh, IT or anything related to computers? Uh, do you have any tips on being relevant in those areas? Yeah, great question. Great question. Everyone hear that? Here's question. Um, so the, the bad news <laughs> is um, nobody hires jack of all trades anymore. People hire because they have an immediate need and it's painful and they have to get it filled. The good news is, once you get hired, if meeting, meeting one of those particular things, then, like I said, you're gonna, you need to continually learn, and you need to then, inside of the company, maybe find other um, opportunities, other situations where your other skills can shine. So being a jack of all trades is a good thing, it's a requirement. The problem is everybody has it, and nobody hires for that. Nobody hires for breadth. They hire for specific skill set that's going to meet a particular pain point that they currently have, is my experience. Yes? Um, as somebody who has hired and works with your teams in your company, how important are soft skills throughout this entire cycle, from the interview to... Right. Um, For smaller companies, it's super important. We can't afford to hire somebody who doesn't have great interpersonal skills. Um, and we also can't afford to hire somebody who's super specialized. While we, again, we going back to Mike's question, we hire for an immediate need, but especially in a small company, we very quickly will take somebody off that immediate need and maybe put them onto something else and something else and some, so, so those kind of skills are important, but, but the soft skills come from this need to identify other problems and help fix those other problems, not just do what your manager says. In a small company, we don't actually have a lot of managers. So it's, it's, each employee is, is an, in some sense self-managed. And if, if one of my employees sees a particular problem and they want to attack it and it actually is going to meet a business need, I'm going to be all for that. In the larger companies, it depends, especially if you're not a tech company, if the company itself is, is actually doing insurance or something and you happen to be a programmer in that company, you're not a profit center, you're a cost center, by the way. Those companies are not great for programmers, although they do have lots of jobs. Um, those are different from what I've been describing during this talk. And in those situations, um, it's, pos it's very possible to just kind of be heads down and not and just keep the mainframe running or you know do whatever that company needs you to do. But that's not the tech companies that I've been talking about during this talk. Question in the back, yes. You have 
Do I have extra handouts? There should be some floating around. Do, do they all get eaten up? If not, we can make some more copies. Uh, hang on, I, I want to make sure everyone gets a chance. Yes? Yeah, so uh, you have a lot of good information about getting into uh, other companies. Oh, good. interested in uh, trying to come up with your own company or having an end game. Right. That's, that's the really interesting safety net on this whole process. If for some reason you go through this stuff and you strike out for whatever reason, right or wrong, there's always the possibility. It's remote and risky, but it could be potentially really lucrative of creating your own company. And I say that because I did it. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the, the opportunities there are um, kind of random. It's, there's no 100% there's no guarantee in that because there's more risk. But whatever. Did, about what you just said. Uh-huh. Was it your first attempt at starting? Yes. It was your first. Yes. Wow. You won the lottery? <laughs> no, I, I worked really hard at it. <laughs> so I'm very interested in data visualization, and if you want to get paid for data visualization, financial data is a great part of data to, to visualize. And that's that's the, there's more to it, but that's the genesis. Yes? I just want to ask a quick uh, question. Would it be, uh, would it be advisable like if you finish one internship, if you don't feel like you gave those lot of experience, but you could take one, a, a few more with taking like, like say if you took an internship, but they didn't really teach you anything, would it be okay if you could seek another internship? It would absolutely be that. But on the other hand, one other thing, as an intern, same deal as when you're in a company, when you just got hired by a company, make sure that you're getting the, the value of that internship out of it. And if not, raise a stink. You're not getting paid a ton of money. Make sure that they are giving you tools and skills and training and whatever to make, to make your, ultimately from an internship, you're trying to make your resume and your cover letter more compelling, okay. right? That's the ultimate goal of, of an internship. I mean, there's other goals, but that's, if you come out of an internship and it doesn't benefit your cover letter and your and your your resume and the story that you tell the interviewer, that inter internship has kind of been a bit of a failure. So you you have every right during an internship to demand that you you get that kind of training. I'm sorry, you've been having yeah, your question up for a while. Um, I was just curious, what is what are some of your greatest needs at stock charts in terms of programming in other ways? Uh, well, okay. so yeah, really <laughs> we'll, we'll take that question offline. How about that? Okay. <laughs> it's a great question, uh, but I, I want to make sure I'm talking generally and more as an LW tech professor here. Yes. So, uh, generally, uh, if there, is, uh, there are a few processes of interview and you got one offer from, from one company, but you want to finish the interview process uh, of the, another. How long is applicable to give an employer uh, to, I, I know that some uh, some developers like ask not uh, get an offer until that process because some offers are uh, could be expired, right? There's, there's actually no rules for any of that and you want to talk to each recruiter to kind of see what their expectations are? I, I know that in uh, Hello companies like Microsoft, Amazon, they uh, have like one or two or three weeks of expiration. So, and if, uh, for example, uh, I just got, and the Amazon told, told me I, I passed and we, we are ready to give you an offer, I want to say, hold on, I want to finish the process of Google because I'm in the third sure. row of the interview. And so how long is this period applicable? And to ask the employer it's a really tricky question. It's very, very difficult to, to fully answer. Because if you don't answer it right, you might offend somebody or they might withdraw the offer. That's the risk. Um, uh, it's, in a great, it's a great place to be in. <laughs> so in that sense, great. I will say one other thing, just another general comment. Um, most people in this industry don't stay in the same company their entire career. I think almost nobody does anymore. That wasn't true. When I grew up, my dad was at IBM. I thought for sure I'd work at IBM forever. Didn't work out that way. Um, even at Microsoft, there are a lot of people, there are some people there that have been there for many, many, many years. But in general, people cycle through that kind of thing. Um, do not, I, and that's another reason, keep your networking going. Work on your soft skills, keep your connections with the college, whatever else, because there may come a day where you're leaving that first company that you're working at, going to a second, maybe starting up your own, whatever. Um, don't think that, or don't, well, the decision's important, 
Absolutely. It isn't necessarily irreversible. It might, it may be five years before you'll get another shot at, at the other company. But anyway, that's, that's another thing to keep in mind. And I would go with, um, I go with Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, a, it's, it's close. It's really close. Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, on um, your point about master's degree, how important is the alumni network of master's degree? For instance, the place I'm entering with offers to pay for master's degree, but it's at an obscure college that I've never heard of. Right. Would that be worth it? Or should you just go to a <laughs> I don't know the I honestly don't know the answer to that question. Okay. My guess is that a master's degree is a master's degree. Okay. Um, it, it's... It, it's treated differently, and so I think it does. As long as you have it, I think is the most important thing. Yeah, the, my experience is the alumni networks of your alma mater are are more valuable, but that's that's not one hundred percent true. Uh, if you go as a master's candidate or a master's graduate through your master's alma mater, they're going to be putting you in master's oriented jobs which may or may not be actually what you're interested in. Remember, master's oriented people are are, are thinking about uh, academic careers. They're thinking about um, you know, teaching and, and uh, PhD kind of opportunities. That's what I'm seeing in my program. Whereas the undergraduate program that I'm still getting uh, connected with is, is you know, real, jo or real jobs. Um, <laughs> don't, don't take that wrong, but, but you see what I'm saying. You see what I'm saying. That's not 100% true either. It's just a general impression. Yes? Uh, so kind of going back to uh, talking about how important do you think it is to go into another company and work with them for a period of time? Obviously, you've worked with Microsoft yeah. for 10 years before you decide to go off and start your own company. Do you think you would have been able to make that startup if you hadn't worked at another company first? OK, so I think I could. But I'm not confident that that's a, a universal answer for anybody. Right. Um, uh, you have to do a huge amount of self-evaluation. Um, the amount of stuff I've learned and the amount of stuff I've had to do um, since the time I started this company and now is, is amazing. And if I knew, if, I, if I'd really thought about all the stuff I had to do between the time I started and 20 years later, I never would have done it. It's just too overwhelming. The, the way that I got through that is just um, being um, uh, optimistically naive. Um, pretty much about just confident in myself and my abilities and just not worrying too much about the super long term, just day by day, making sure that I'm, um, the company is going in the direction that I want it to go into. And for me, it happened to work out. Um, there's luck involved. There's skill involved. There's self-confidence involved. Um, there's existing experience involved. Um, a lot of interpersonal skills that I was able to develop um, working at Microsoft and even before then have come into play. It's a hodgepodge. I mean, entrepreneurship is, yeah, it's a whole other class. So, I, yeah, anyway, another question. How do we go about finding good internships? Because a lot of those that are out there want like a year or more of programming experience. Or right. You come teach us rather than. Right. Um, so, don't take no for an answer. <laughs> Treat it like a miniature uh, rehearsal for the real job interviews that are going to come later. You have to get experience by getting experience, which is, you know, again, that chicken egg problem. If the internships uh, become the situation where you have to have a ton of experience before you can even get an internship, that whole, the whole thing breaks down. Don't forget, you can develop your own project. So in other words, when you're applying for an internship, of course, you're gonna, they're, they should be expecting you to have almost no experience. That's what they should be expecting. And if they're not, I, I question that company. Um, but even within that uh, realm of internships, things are getting competitive because people are realizing how important they are. And so you, can, you still need to differentiate yourself from the other people applying for the internship. Going above and beyond your professor's assignments is the way you do that. Also, basically everything I said just in miniature um, applies to applying for an in internship. Yes? Well, it was kind of a point I wanted to make is that um, if, you know, like making your own projects, you or even like you're going to classes, going above and beyond the uh, instructor's projects. Um, for 
like you could you can almost kind of say that that is you know like a year of experience in programming. It might not necessarily be professional experience, but it's experience in programming and kind of being like in a uh, independent contractor almost. Mm -hmm. It's experience is experience. You have to hunt for it. Um, nobody's going to give it to you. Uh, internships should be the proper path forward, but they're not the only path forward. And again, they're getting more competitive over time. Tomorrow, job fair in the commons downstairs, there should be people offering internships. We were there last fall. We're not here this, this spring, but um, or, or, I'm sorry, this fall. We were here last summer, but we're not here this fall. Uh, but there should be other ones that are there and absolutely do there. Also, you do not have to just go to job fairs here for internships. P keep, keep your eyes open for job fairs over at UW Bothell. There's a lot of possibilities and opportunities over there at those job fairs, and you're totally able to go to those. Uh, when, I, when we were here, we had students from UW Bothell coming up to us and giving us or applying to our uh, internships even though we were here. So there's no, you, there's no um, you, you can visit them. It's totally fine, yes. Um, I'm sorry, let me go here first, please, if I could, because you had your hand up for a while. Yes, I just had a quick question. How important is a master's degree when it comes to all of this? So I think a master's degree is important for progressing in a company. I don't think it's, it's, it's not an entry level requirement for most of these positions. Um, only in the most challenging and, and competitive environments would it be a requirement. Um, it is not easy to get, I'll tell you right now. I'm a bit shocked by how difficult my comp side master's program is turning out to be. Um, I would consider it as a um, um, somewhat of a last resort. They're also expensive. Uh, the good news is there are more and more of them online. I'm taking an online one. Uh, I'm going doing it through Syracuse. But there are lots of other ones that are available.